So uh, at this point, uh, I want to turn it over. We've got um, a lot to get through, as always with these workshops, and we've really uh, got a great group of, um, of presenters today. And I'm going to, let me just give you a quick sense of what our agenda is. We are going to hear from three presenters. Uh, we're gonna hear from Jenna Koloski, we're gonna hear from Rebecca Sanborn Stone, and we're gonna hear from Andrea Cohen. And then uh, we're going to, just like our normal uh, sort of uh, workshop, we're gonna go into breakout sessions where we can sort of learn from each other and talk about sort of our work in, in this area and, and, and sort of compare notes with one another. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jenna. You know, Jenna and I were just talking. VCRD does a lot of work around community visits, right? That we work in communities and, um, and so she's gonna share sort of what is our outreach strategy when we do those community visits and, and, and sort of what have we learned from that. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Jenna, to take it away. Thanks, John. Um, hi, everyone. Good to see everybody. Um, I'm gonna pull up a PowerPoint. As I'm doing that, I'll just say, John, I don't know if I've heard a phrase that better describes our current times than a different level of differentness. <laughs> That is definitely how I've been feeling. Um, okay, let me just share my PowerPoint here. And I'm gonna do this. And then I'm gonna do this. Okay, does that look all right? Good? Yeah, we okay. Great. All right, so inviting the public. Um, so hopefully you're all on this call because you're interested in hearing uh, more about strategies to bring more voices into the work that you're doing in your communities and to think about how to invite and engage members of the community to participate in your work. So what I want to do is really walk through a set of practical tips um, and think about uh, strategies that you could employ in your own community to bring to bring people into the work that you're doing. Um, as John said, you know, in the at the Council on Rural Development, our work is really grounded in bringing voices in to community processes. Um, in normal times, we lead community visits around the state. So we work with a community to bring people together and walk through um, identifying priorities for the community and then building action plan and connecting to resources to get things done. Um, part of that work is to bring new voices and new communities into new community members into the process and oftentimes we work with a town and they say we only have 30 people that even show up for our town meeting or something like that or i've never seen a meeting in this town of more than 15 people and um we often are able to bring a lot more people into the room um walking through a, a tried and true process of engagement that we walk through so i'm going to walk through exactly what we do to, to bring people's voices in. But of course, we're always working and learning to, to bring in um, new voices to the process. So to walk through what I'm gonna go through, there's some pretty um, backbone uh, elements of successful engagement. One is identifying your purpose, which I'll get into a little bit. And then it's all about planning and discussing and assembling a team. And then it's about building your event thinking about who to invite and how to engage. And then unfortunately, um, there's really no silver bullet to successful engagement. It's really about putting in the work on the ground, putting in the time and the energy and recruiting folks in your community to help you get the word out and bring people into a process. And then also about thinking and, and following up. I do wanna mention um, in our leadership resource guide that hopefully you've all seen, and if not, maybe Nick could plug a, a link into the chat. There's a whole chapter on inviting the public and you'll see that it really, oh, there John has it <laughs> held up there. Um, it really walks through in more detail these steps that I'm going to go through. So use that as your guide um, and it, it really walks through the process that we use. So first, identifying your purpose. There's all kinds of different reasons to bring community voices into the work that you're doing and it's really important. Um, sometimes we can get uh, overzealous with, well, we need to engage the public. And so you go out and start inviting, but you may not be completely clear on exactly what your question is to the public. What are you asking them to say or do, or how are you asking for their input? Uh, you'll see this chart on the slide that just kind of 
walks through that spectrum of engagement. You know, if you are working on a project, you might just be wanting to inform the public. Um, you know, here's something that we're working on, you're going to be seeing in your community soon. And there's strategies like flyers and newsletters and websites to do that. You might be wanting to consult. And so you might be wanting to collect public comment on a decision that your group is making, but you may not be asking for the community to make that decision. It's important to know um, that and to be clear when you're inviting folks to say, come share your thoughts, <laughs> come share your comments. Um, involving, working directly with the public um, throughout the effort to hear their ideas and to really integrate their ideas into the work that you're doing. And then there's collaborating, partnering with the community bringing them into the work, um, having advisory committees that are guiding your work, having um, participatory decision making and conversations with the community. And then there's empowering. And this is where our community visits go to, which is actually including the community in making final decision. And so as you're designing your process for engagement, it's really important to know ahead of time where you fall on that spectrum and then to communicate that up front. You know, I think um, a community process really goes wrong when maybe people engage because they think that they are going to have a decision to make when then they realize that they don't have a decision to make at all you were just looking for their thoughts and input so it's really important to be clear it's okay to engage just for thoughts and input but just to be clear about that up front so think about the language you're invited to share your vision you're invited to learn more about you're invited to discuss or you're invited to decide on priorities for the future like just be clear about what, what those questions are ahead of time and then it's about the planning and discussing and assembling. So when you think about inviting the public, it really isn't about just the invitation to come out to an event, right? It really starts with the beginning of your planning and thinking about who's on your team and who, who are you engaging from the beginning um, in terms of planning the work that you're doing. Um, building a relationship of inclusion and trust and connection with different constituents that you hope to engage in your community is really critical early on um, because that's really what genuine engagement is about not just asking for input later once you've already designed a process but actually engaging people in the process and building a sense of ownership and connection to the process itself um, so in community visits um, we build a steering committee early on that helps to guide the outreach and engagement process um, you might build a task force or a committee as you're working to plan an event or a process that you want people to engage in. And as you're designing that committee, really think about a 360 analysis of your community. Who are the folks that you wanna bring into this conversation? Um, have you connected with school leaders, with municipal leaders, with people of color in your community, with lower income community members, um, youth? Um, really think about those all the different areas that you want to connect to in your community in that inviting the public chapter in the leadership guide there's a really great list that can kind of tee up some of those ideas to walk through the different people or representatives or folks that you might want to um, bring into the conversation um, and as you're uh, thinking about this the most useful way to build your list is to actually make some calls and ask people in your community who you might bring into the process um, when i start work with a community that's really uh what i'm doing is like calling people up and kind of gossiping about their community and saying you know who are the people that are you know maybe they haven't been very engaged in a community process but they're really interested in the school and could we bring them into this process or um who are the key leaders that if they're engaged with this work um then all of the hunters in town might want to engage in the process or the folks that really have a network that can help to invite so you want to be thinking about who will contribute to and be um a kind of a meaningful contributions to a process, but also has good connections in the community that can help to bring other people in as you build your, your process. So that's a lot of what I do. Um, you know, school principals that are particularly engaged have really great thoughts on youth engagement and on, you know, parents that are engaged in the school community that could participate. Um, but ask around and really get a sense for the people that, um, that you might bring in. And, and make personal invitations to them. Like sometimes um, if you put out a broad call for a committee, you may not get a lot of participation, especially new participation. But if you call someone up and say, you know, 
we really need the perspective of a young parent on this committee. It'd be really helpful to have you on the team. It can help to bring people in and foster that connection early on. So once you have your, your uh, team together, you'll wanna put, spend some time planning your event or campaign or the work that you're doing, um, and then work together to build that outreach plan. Um, at this point, and I'm gonna actually walk through a worksheet that we use to do this, but really use your team. Now you have this diverse team in the room. You have people that know different parts of the community that you may not know very well. Really engage with them and help uh, walk through a process to ask them all the different ways to share. You know, when we do this work in a community, sometimes you have someone say, well, I have this list, email list, and I have this other email list, but you might see some duplication. We say, great. <laughs> if people see this five, seven, 10 different times, what it does is it creates buzz around an event. And it says, this is an important conversation that I should be a part of. So really think about all the ways that you can reach people in a community um, everywhere they're gonna be and everywhere they're gonna get their information. And I'll walk through that process that we use in just a second. Um, one thing that's really important is to make it personal. I got into this a little bit, but the most effective way to bring people in is to actually reach out to them directly and to ask them to be a part of this because their voice is important. You know, we often, um, we will have people on our steering committee make direct phone calls to people in a community. All the time I have people show up to a meeting and say, I don't really know why I'm here, but I got a phone call and so and so said that I should be a part of this meeting and they show up because they know that they're valued and that their voice is important. So that personal outreach um, is really important. When you think about your broad outreach, just try it and avoid um, tokenizing. Sometimes we have a tendency to think that um, just because somebody is a part of a group, any sort of group that they speak for that group, um, unless they're an elected spokesperson or leader of a, of a group, just make sure that your outreach and your engagement from the beginning is broad enough that people don't feel singled out or put on the spot in, in the work that you're doing. So really think broadly about how to bring everyone into the conversation. And again, coming back to being really clear about the ask, um, you know, come tonight to choose priorities for the future, come tonight to share your input, like be really clear about what you, how you want people to engage. Um, I'll just really quickly um, oh, and I, I do want to mention um, a couple things about inclusion and building processes that people want to engage in and be a part of. Um, number one, uh, in the leadership guide, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but there is a, a section on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion and engaging and it, building inclusiveness into your process and work. And there's a series of great questions in that chapter to really walk through and think about as you structure your process, is it one that people can genuinely and effectively engage in in a meaningful way. So just to point you uh, to that resource. But also when you plan your event, um, also just really think about is this event accessible? Um, is it held in a location that people can access? Is it held at a time that people that you want to engage with are available? Sometimes even though it takes some additional work and potentially Fun, funding, um, it can be useful to think about providing things like childcare or a meal, um, or in some cases we've provided transportation to meetings, recognizing that folks in the community might have a hard time getting to the, the location where the meeting is going to be. So um, when you want to build inclusiveness and engagement, think about your outreach and invitation, but also think about is it possible for these people I'm reaching out to to be a part of this? And think um, and are there multiple ways to engage in the conversation? Um, you know, showing up to a meeting, some people are able to do that. Other people may want to participate via an online survey or a paper survey at the local general store or library. So just think about, have I created ways for people to engage in the way that they're comfortable engaging? We even in in-person meetings, will put out pieces of paper for people to participate um, in writing if they, don't, if they don't want to share in the meeting. Just a quick example of one community's um, outreach that this was in Montgomery. Um, in order to build interest and engagement in the process, they created their own little logo and name of their process, Montgomery Thrives. Really clear about, you know, voting priorities for action. Join us to help shape the future of Montgomery. So really clear about that ask and, and what people are being asked to participate in. And you'll see they uh, created a, a Facebook page here as well as the, the materials to share. Um, 
So create your materials in a way that are engaging and that are clear. You know, sometimes for community events, you can read a flyer and say, what exactly are they asking us to participate in? Like be really clear about what you're asking people to be a part of. And here, just to get really practical, is the template that we use when we're designing our outreach plan. Um, it's not rocket science. You'll see it's fairly simple in terms of the structure, but this really helps us to work with the steering committee to guide um, our plan for outreach. Uh, so you'll see in the different boxes here, um, a letter to all residents. That's something that we really encourage communities to, it does take some financial and time investment, but really valuable. We did that at a, a process we had here in my own town in Huntington. We put inserts in the local newspaper that goes out to everyone in town um, and also mailed a postcard. That can be really valuable if your town clerk is willing to kind of work with you and the select board willing to work with you on a mailing to get information out that way. Um, and you'll see right next to that, it says list steering committee member who volunteered to contact town. So really important when you're working with your committee to get commitments from your committee members to be the ones leading on these different tasks. Um, that's another thing that's valuable about a committee is you don't need to do all the work yourself. You can enlist your team. Um, we have a whole section for press here. Think about all the different press avenues in your community. And it's not just newspaper, you know, sending a press release is great, but also is there a public access TV station? They're often happy to put it on their bulletin board or even do a show um, to talk about the process that you're engaging in. Um, radio stations often will share a PSA for community events or will even have you on to interview you about the event that you're doing. And it's really fun. Like you go on and you chat with someone and, and share what um, your invitation. We have a whole section here for phone calls. Um, it's again that personal outreach I can't stress enough how important it is to ask other community members to reach out to people in the community and invite them to participate. Um, it doesn't take that long to just get a quick call in and say your voice is really important please show up you know on August 2nd whatever it is um, and we actually assign steering committee members and build a list. Some communities have called everyone in their town their town's small enough to do that um, in Greensboro a group of women who walk regularly went around and knocked on every door and handed out flyers. Um, you know, it, it, there are ways in these small communities to actually reach everyone in that personal way. Um, and then this other bucket is for everything else. <laughs> so it's a, a brainstorming with the committee to think about uh, newsletters that go out in the community, websites where information can be posted, a letter going home. Often schools are willing to put letters in backpacks home with kids. Um, or send things and send things through their email newsletters, groups in town, email distribution list, front porch forum or other listservs, um, poster distribution. Are there a couple people that are willing to put up uh, flyers around town, um, signage like sandwich boards, uh, banners, that kind of thing. And then uh, oftentimes local grocery stores and markets are willing to put flyers in bags. So get really creative and think broadly about what are the ways people get information in Montgomery, that example I showed you, they put table tents on every table in the like five bars they have in their, in their village center in Montgomery. So um, think of the, all the places people show up in town. Um, so this is where it's put in the work. Um, I wish that there was a magic trick to bring people out to meetings, but it really is about getting out there on the ground, making the calls, putting the information out, doing it again, <laughs> repeating it so that you start to create. I, we always hear the term buzz in a community. There's a lot of buzz around this event because the more people hear about it, they think, gosh, this must be important. This isn't just that one post on Front Porch Forum or the notice of a public meeting. It's You're seeing it all over town. You're hearing about all these different ways. You're hearing about it from people that you're connected to, that you trust, um, that you know, the group that you're a part of is sharing it. And so it becomes an important event. So this list is all the different ways you might do that. Um, this is in that guide uh, chapter in the resource guide. So this is all listed out there for some different ideas. Um, but of course, uh, it's all about creativity. Every community is different. When you look at that list that's kind of generic, think about how to adapt that to your own community. What's going to speak to the people in your town? There's a list here that I just shared. Are there local photographers that can share imagery 
uh, community art projects, uh, web specialists, students that would engage in a way that you may not be able to with, with young people. And I know Rebecca is going to get into more of these kind of creative ideas. Um, just wanted to share, um, this is one of my favorite outreach signs <laughs> in Randolph. Uh, they had a process that brought out like 250 people um, in town and this sign on a trailer that a local farmer put up, um, get downtown April 10th. Um, that was right off the exit in town and that speaks to people. They see that and think, gosh, that must be something interesting that I should be involved in. But also they put up these flyers in vacant store windows in downtown um, and really got creative with how they were, they were sharing. Um, and the last thing here is just, it's hard to see, but these are shirts hanging on the bridge, Montpelier, that this is an exercise called airing your dirty laundry, where people put challenges on the front of the t-shirt and then in the washing instructions, put a little tab with potential solutions. So just a creative way to engage people in sharing their ideas that isn't just showing up for a meeting. And finally, um, the last point that's really really critical is about thinking and following up. So once people engage in the process, once you've invited them to take part, capturing contact information is really useful. And then getting back to them to say thanks for participating and giving them ways to stay connected to the process. So you'll see using the Montgomery example, a thank you for the 150 people that came out in this small town to participate. And then, an, and then a next step of here's a survey that you can share to share to um, collect more information. And then an example up in Burke, this isn't one of our processes, this is a group that stemmed from one of our processes that is now um, doing a, a, a charrette process in West Burke, looking at the future of development there. And, and they shared this great post, thanking everybody, thanking the local vendors that were a part of it, um, thanking the local organizations that helped to share and just really, continuing to share photos and keep people engaged um, and into next steps in the process. So that's just a really quick walk through of the kind of practical engagement steps. Um, I know that uh, we have Rebecca on, I think next maybe John, who's gonna get into some more of those creative ideas, which she is really excellent at, at and I'm excited to see those. And I'm just gonna take the liberty to introduce Rebecca before she speaks. You know. When we um, think about the origins of this Vermont Community Leadership Network, one of the points of origin was the work that we did with some of you around a mutual aid network that came together this spring. And Rebecca was really fundamental in that work. And in, in, and in that way really contributed to our conception of this leadership network and sort of what its potential was and what it could be. So I really want to acknowledge that. And Rebecca Sanborn Stone not only uh, uh, helped with that, but she is uh, working all over the state of Vermont and beyond in real partnership with communities in thinking creatively about how to do this public engagement, how to think about particular spaces and projects and broad conversations. And so we feel really lucky uh, that Rebecca is able to join us. She has had some connectivity issues, so we're going to sort of let her know whether we can hear her or not. But I'll turn it over to Rebecca uh, at this point. So it's all you. Thanks so much, John. Um, it's great to be here with all of you. I'm having a really Vermont day when it comes to engagement and connections. Um, my internet connection at home went out just as this call was starting. So thank goodness for libraries. I am parked outside of the library downtown and hope this will work. But do count on somebody to break in and let me know if the quality is not good enough to continue here. We're good. Okay. Fingers crossed. Everybody uh, take a deep breath and we'll Hope that it works on. So I'm going to make a second effort here to share my screen and see if I can share some slides with you. Um, give me just a minute here. Whoops. All right. So 
Everybody see slides? Thumbs up from John. Okay, then we'll dive in. I'm going to wave through this really quickly. So as John said, I've had the great honor and privilege of working with a lot of communities across North America, actually, and especially working really extensively in a number of Vermont communities over the years. I'm one half of Community Workshop with my partner, David Hohenshaw, and we really specialize and focus a lot on creative community engagement, how to get out of the same rut in the same old patterns that places everywhere have tried and that just plain don't work. I think just about every community I've worked in has said at some point, we have such a volunteer problem or we have such an engagement problem. You know, we post our notices and nobody comes. Um, and I think most of those cases, it's not that there's a volunteer problem or an engagement problem. It's that the people organizing are stuck in the same ruts and the same methods of trying to engage people. And it just plain doesn't work. So that was a great introduction from Jenna. She covered a lot of the principles and top tips that we use at Community Workshop. I'm going to give you a couple overviews. Since she told you so much about what works, I'm going to give you a couple tips to how not to make it work. So number one, a lot of people really start the process by saying we want to engage the general public and there just plain is no general public. If you start with that premise and start by thinking that you are going to engage everybody and especially that you're going to do it using the same methods, you are bound to fail. <laughs> You just plain can't do it because you're not working with one general public. You are working with a community of individuals. Everyone has different experiences, different needs, different hopes, different values. And if you really want to engage them, you have to approach it as individuals. Lesson number two, uh, people almost always start from their own frame of reference. And this is not a complaint against anyone. This is a human tendency. We start to think about what we care about, what we want to say, how we want people to engage, what we want them to do. And that is also guaranteed to fail for you. When we start by focusing on ourselves, we are pretty much inherently going to be crafting messages and engagement opportunities that only work for people very much like us who already care about the things we want to care about and can engage in those same ways. So. If you want to fail, focus on yourself for sure. Design an engagement process that you would love, but don't think about anybody else. Last lesson, um, and this is kind of the fallback. I think when people don't think really creatively about engagement or have that goal of focusing on the general public, we tend to fall back on doing what everybody else does. We have to make a poster, right? Because that's how we advertise events. We have to to send a postcard. We have to publicize it in the paper. Um, maybe, maybe not. When we just put out messages and engagement opportunities that become part of the noise and the clutter, you really aren't going to break through. And if the particular groups and audiences you want to reach are not using those channels or wouldn't pay attention to those messages, it doesn't matter how flashy your posters are or how many postcards you manage to deliver, they're not going to have the impact you want to have. So what do we do differently? I'm just going to run through a few top tips today. I could probably do a full day workshop on this and some of you have done workshops, but this is just kind of a teaser for you. So let's see. Um, number one top secret to remember, and Jenna said this as well, so really take this one home. All engagement has to be personal. And how do you make it personal? Couple things to keep in mind. So the top tip number one, really think like your audience. That means, first of all, figuring out who your audience is, who are the very particular stakeholders that you want to reach. I usually use a framework called community-based social marketing for thinking through this. And while traditional marketing might be a little bit more like, how do we take what we want to do and sell it to people or get them to do what we want to do, community-based social marketing is different. It is a process that really starts with getting very clear on what action, what behavior, what outcome you want out of this. Jenna shared that engagement ladder, which is really critical. Do you want people to just put uh, a comment down on a piece of paper? Are you looking for them to get really involved? Are you looking to partner with them? What exactly do you need out of this? And then second, whoops, too fast who needs to act who needs to get involved who needs to speak and i mean that really specifically not just a demographic group like seniors or residents of your community but who are these people what do they care about what is their life experience like 
what are the barriers to participation? Number three, what do they really need in order to do that? This is where it really starts to deviate from some of the traditional engagement approaches. Your job is to solve their problems when it comes to engagement, not just to create an opportunity that works for you and hope they'll show up, but to make that as easy as possible. So the fourth step is really how can you help reduce those barriers and overcome those needs? Here's an example for you. Um, I like to pick on my own town sometimes, Bethel. Actually, this is not just Bethel, but a number of years ago, Bethel was offering free summer meals along with other towns in our SU. How did they publicize it? With this press release that's printed in the bottom of the newspaper. So this is a classic case of trying engagement from your own perspective and thinking like yourself. The SU thinks it has news to share, that there's this great program and sort of puts out a message that aligns with that. Instead, you really need to think about your audience and what would resonate with them. Instead of summer food service programs planned, which sounds really wonky and isn't that appealing to the people who actually need food, it would be really critical to shape this message differently and say free meals for kids, <laughs> free meals for everybody, and then think about how you can get that message out differently. So here's an example of doing it really differently. This is the lunchbox from Green Mountain Farm to School. And they took this a lot of steps further, thinking about who's the actual audience that needs free meals in the summer? It's kids. And where are they going to be? They're probably going to be at playgrounds and parks. They may not have transportation to get to the school. So they brought the meals to kids and made them look really, really fun and made them really tasty. So this is a case of thinking about that audience, thinking about what they need and making it as easy as possible for them to engage. Tip number two, offer a lot of options. Um, so before I share this with you, I will say this may sound overwhelming. Engagement takes a lot of time and when you do it really well, well, it really takes a lot of time. There's simply no shortcut. So what I'm going to show you is kind of the gold standard of how you could offer a lot of options. You need to be realistic. You may not be able to do this much. But here's an example from town planning. Sort of the status quo is to have a planning forum or a meeting at town hall and warn that meeting in the paper, put it out and hope a bunch of people show up. And usually we get like three or four people who show up. Um, here are some posters from around the country that do a better job. These are way more engaging than that typical warned meeting announcement. But there's still a problem with this. There's really only one option for engagement. You still have to show up at this particular time and it has to be interesting enough for you and you have to have the ability to get there and have childcare and things like that. Uh, so here's an example of how it looks different. We worked with Woodstock, Vermont on their planning and visioning process a couple years ago now. And what we really focused on was creating as many options for people to weigh in as possible. So we did a survey and did the traditional planning meetings if people wanted to engage that way, but also created a lot of ways to engage that might only take you five minutes and that you could do anywhere you were in the community and really couldn't avoid it if you were going about your daily lives. So you can see postcards hanging in the windows. These postcards were everywhere, on the shop counters, at the library, out on street corners, and just had a simple question or two that people could respond to. And then we put them up so that people could really see the answers as well. We had the same questions in different formats. On the top are stickers that we put in empty storefront windows so people could respond right there on the street in about 30 seconds while they're walking by. Jenna mentioned bars. We put the same questions onto custom coasters and left them on the bars so that while people were sitting and having a drink, they could weigh in right there. And then we went to people as well. So some people really do want to engage but they may not come to that meeting. So in this case, we took it to the senior center. And instead of just having a regular planning meeting, we had a story circle, which ended up being one of the most powerful conversations, I think, in the whole process. And we did a similar one downtown, but really focusing on younger residents, um, people who had just moved in, and we called that speed neighboring, so that it would be a little bit more appealing to that group. You can also really think about options even at an event. So the final culminating event was really at a community picnic. And we gave an option for people to spend a lot of time weighing in. You can see a set of posters in the background. So you could spend half an hour reading those and weighing in if you wanted. 
or you could take two minutes and vote on your priorities with candy corn as you're walking by the station. Okay, uh, next one, give something to get something, which is really important. We're often asking people to make a pretty big commitment when they're engaging in something, and it's only fair that we give something back, make it worth their time as much as possible. And it also happens to really increase engagement. So here's kind of the typical option, community workshop to create a master plan, right? Come, we just expect you to show up and expect you to be interested in this sort of thing. Um, hope you'll come. This one's offering light refreshments, which is a good option. Maybe that will appeal. But there are really a lot of ways that you can give back much, much more. So here's an example from Fairly, Vermont, Main Street to Maury. They wanted to collect input from people, so they threw a big hot chocolate party and gave away hot chocolate and had s'mores and made it really, really fun. So people were first and foremost coming out for a fun social event on the green in winter. And by the way, while they were there, they could weigh in with some feedback as well. Here's another example from Hyde Park, Vermont. We asked kids through the elementary schools to create a design of what they imagined for the streets and some parks in town. And we're really asking them to spend some time thinking about what they envisioned for their community. One of the most important things you can give back is not necessarily free hot chocolate or refreshments, but actually following through on what people say. So the Hyde Park Steering Committee, when this was all over, took a day and made those kids' visions come true. And they did it in a really simple way. The kids imagined a lot of rainbows and unicorns right out front of their school, enlivening that approach in the streetscape. And the steering committee made that happen for the first day back, which sends a really powerful message to kids that your input matters. We're gonna try to make some things happen that you actually said. Last one before I wrap up here, um, and I would say this is probably the most important one we can be thinking about these days, and that's to prioritize equity. Most communities kind of say they want really diverse participation and that it matters to reach everyone, but we don't work all that hard on it. It's always an afterthought. You know, we try to get as many community members out to a meeting as possible, but if it doesn't actually represent the demographics of the community, oh well, we tried. Right? Most projects are guilty of this. And we really need to do better as community organizers, all of us, when we're doing this. So there are a lot of ways to do it. One is as simple as really just prioritizing it, making your efforts to reach underrepresented communities the first efforts you're gonna undertake and the most important. I wanted to just share one great example from Essex to wrap up here. So Essex decided to host some racial justice and policing conversations this summer. And they did a couple things that are really very simple, but such important steps to equity. So one is translating materials. A lot of communities say we don't have diversity in Vermont, but that's just not true. And if you wanna create a welcoming space and invite people in, translating materials, letting people know that you see them, you understand that they're here is such a critical step. The second one is hard to see. It's a little bit buried on the poster on the left, but offering stipends for people who identify as BIPOC, offering stipends to people who are low income. We need to recognize that you have to have a certain amount of privilege in order to participate in the ways that we typically offer, to come out to a meeting, to respond to a survey. And if we truly want representation and want to do that fairly, it's about time that we really start compensating people not just making sure that it's possible for them, but valuing their time and input. So this may feel like a stretch to you, but I think this is where the field is going. And if there's one thing we can all do that would really move us forward in Vermont, I think it's taking some baby steps toward equity and participation. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much. It's great to be here and so glad internet held out for a few minutes. Uh, Rebecca, that was awesome. It, it, that was awesome, period, but especially awesome given that you had to race downtown to the library to make <laughs> it happen. So huge appreciation to you. Uh, finally, I want to introduce uh, Andrea Cohen. And, you know, a, a lot of what we've been talking about so far is sort of the community-based outreach where we're reaching out to a town, trying to get people to participate. Andrea works at Vermont Electric Co-op, so that's sort of a different frame to think about outreach, when you have a customer base or you're working uh, with a different community that maybe isn't a town community. So, um, and you know, Andrea, 
between her work at Vermont Electric Co-op, uh, the businesses for so social responsibility, she's just got a deep set of experiences to draw from. So really appreciate you joining us, Andrea Cohen. Thank you so much. And it's amazing. I'm looking at who's here and um, I know we have a lot of experts just, you know, listening in. So I'm humbled by uh, the breadth of experience, but I'm happy to share a few things. And um, it's so interesting because Jenna and Rebecca's slides, like we didn't collude, but boy, I'm going to reinforce a lot of the same messages. So um, I'll try not to be uh, redundant. Um, as John said, I'm Andrea. I work um, with Vermont Electric Cooperative. I do government affairs and member relations. I've been there about five years uh, prior to that. I was at VBSR, which was uh, Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility, a statewide organization. And prior to that, I worked for the state of Vermont at the Agency of Natural Resources for 16 years. Again, another statewide um, organization where you know some of the challenges are a little different, but um, I, I have some tips and things to share just from my experience and I'll just throw them out there and um, just kind of run through it. VEC, um, just to give you a sense of what we're, we are now, we are in the northern part of the state. We are a cooperative. Everybody who is a member, um, who, who gets service from us is a member. So by definition, it's kind of like everybody's engaged in theory, but our challenge of course is to really make that meaningful engagement. Um, it's believe it or not, very diverse in a lot of ways, um, despite the lack of diversity <laughs> on, on the surface, but politically, economically, and whatnot. And one of those first lessons, um, oh, well, I'll just go over the few thoughts that I'll get back to. I have to get rid of you guys so I can see my own slides. Okay, I'll do that. Um, can you hear me okay? Everybody? Good. All right. Um, so a few thoughts, just to bring it all down to a few things, a few takeaways. Meeting people where they're at, um, dealing with your limited resources and how you prioritize. There's so many outreach and engagement tools out there. You know, how do you prioritize and use your resources well? Um, a little tip about, quote, recycling content, um, measuring what matters and what, frankly, you have the resources to measure and having some fun while you're doing this all. So, um, one of our challenges at VEC, um, and this uh, echoes Jenna's comment about really getting to know who, who you're dealing with, if you could see on our slides, VEC's members, um, the majority of them, I got to move my thing so I could see my own slides. Let's see how I do that. Let me see. All right, I got rid of everybody. Um, the 42% um, of our members are over 65 and 43% of them are retired or you know not employed. So when we're working on our engagement strategies, it really influences things such as like when we have our annual meeting, you know, frankly, we don't do it at night. Older people don't like to drive, so we're not gonna force them to a night meeting. Um, uh, we, we have an e-newsletter, uh, we have a print newsletter, and we've continued to do the print uh, newsletter because a lot of our older members um, prefer to have a print newsletter. And we know it's expensive and, and whatnot, but we're going to keep doing that because we don't want to leave those folks behind. Uh, another thing has to do with broadband and internet. Our service territory um, does not have great broadband um, connectivity for the most part. So um, we, when we redid our website, we, per, you know, on purpose, did, got rid of like those really complicated visuals and things that take a while to load um, because we found some members were having trouble, you know, just accessing content. So that's another thing to think about, about connectivity in your service territory. Um, when it when it comes to tools, there was a lot of talk about, you know, there's so many options out there, you know, everything from hanging out at the transfer station on a Saturday morning to, um, you know, pretty, you know, innovative, you know, being hip with the kids kind of stuff, like doing TikTok or whatnot. We look at your, who you're trying to get to and decide, is it worth your time and effort? Um, another thing is like, where do you have skills and talent on your team or with your volunteers? If somebody's like, I love doing Facebook, it's like, great, run with Facebook. Um, I, I once after asked a doctor about uh, prioritizing, you know, what, what exercise is the best thing for me? And he said, well, do the one you're going to do. That's the best one. So I'd say in, in this space as well, if there's something that terrifies you or you just don't feel like you can get there, you know, don't stress about it and prioritize the ones that um, you feel like you can really take and run with. Um, 
Recycling content, um, I, I emphasize that a lot with the people I work with. You know, every time we want to get a message out, it's like this whole effort to kind of create content and get images and all that. It's like, didn't we do this message, you know, a few weeks ago? Why don't we just do it again? And not only is that, you know, really save time and effort, it's actually effective. If the, I never studied communications, but, you know, as I've looked around, I've seen things like you know, being redundant with your communication and, you know, effective frequency, the rule of seven, it takes seven times, you know, for someone to really go from, you know, say curiosity to a decision point. Um, so please do, you know, recycle and be redundant and reuse content. It's not lame. It's actually an effective way to get your message out. Um, Measuring what matters, uh, just a, a quick comment on this, um, you know, when you do your plan for the year, you know, part of that is, you know, how do you know if you were successful? Of, short, you know, of course, you should set it up in a way that you can measure your outcomes, but, you know, be careful about that because sometimes what you're measuring isn't really getting to what you care about. Uh, an example is we, you know, document how many people call into our service center and the line on top was last year and the line below is this year. And you might just look at this and say, wow, people are less engaged this year. You know, what are you doing wrong? But as a matter of fact, it's what are we doing right? Which is we've really upped our um, online presence and we're seeing that, you know, increase. So, um, you know, certainly do measure, but make sure you're measuring what matters and, and frankly, things that are kind of easy to measure um, given resources, limitations. Um, having fun. Um, I think Rebecca spoke about this. Uh, it's about being creative and having some fun, not only for the people that you're trying to reach, but also for your team, you know, to avoid burnout. A few things uh, we've done, uh, we have a member discount program and we just made up this little sign. Uh, and when we go out to a retailer or someone that we invite to be part of the program, we're like, hey, can we take a picture of you with our little member discount sign? And some of the stuff we got was just amazing. It was just such little effort. And this is uh, something we can use in our promotions and on social media, just all these amazing people who are having fun with the little member discount um, sign. Down below, you'll see those are from our school visits. Uh, we learned, um, we only send line workers and field people out to school visits now because if you come with tools and equipment and hard hats and gloves, the kids love it and that's what they remember. They don't remember, you know, when we're talking about patronage capital benefits and things like that. So uh, making it fun is really important. Another example is our community solar, which we think is amazing and exciting and all that, but um, there's a little burnout in terms of just images of beautiful solar fields that only people maybe who are really into it um, appreciate. Uh, so we decided to kick off um, a little video to explain, uh, you know, the details, which are pretty dry and boring to read through about, you know, how to enroll and whatnot. And we had, you know, animated chickens and cows and things, you know, talking about the details of the program. And um, it was received very well and very engaging and translated nicely to print media as well, where we just grabbed some images. So um, having some fun with that. Uh, other things on Community Solar, we got these little sunflower seed packets from local producer and um, branded them for the Community Solar. Uh, obviously sunflowers for the theme. We had little Frisbees, we had little, uh, we had umbrellas that we gave to the people that actually enrolled. And not only did they enjoy getting them, we enjoy giving this stuff out. So um, having some fun. So a few examples, I wanted to keep it kind of short, but uh, to say, you know, meeting the people where they're at, um, you know, prioritizing the, all those tools out there uh, in ways that make sense for you and the members, uh, the folks you're trying to reach. Don't be shy to recycle content. It's actually an effective communication strategy. Um, make sure you're, you're measuring, but only measure what matters, what you're really gonna use that information going forward and, and making sure you have some fun while you're doing it. So uh, that was what I wanted to share. Thank you for the opportunity, it's fun. Uh, thank you. For Amy. sure. Really uh, appreciate that. Yeah. That, yeah. That's great. You know, um, we feel like it's really important to sort of allow you all, like what we want to do with these workshops is give a chance for you to talk with each other. You all have something in common, which is you decided to spend this hour or hour and a half on this topic. 
And frankly, that's a good conversation starter. So our plan now is uh, to break into small groups of like six or seven of you. And we're trying something new this time, which is, look, this is a, the Vermont Community Leadership Network. You are all leaders, which means we are gonna send you into breakout groups without a leader, with no facilitator, because we have sort of this confidence that you amongst yourself can sort of guide a conversation around this. So I'm actually gonna share screen quickly to give you sort of a sense of what our, our um, prompts are for that. Uh, can folks see that all right? Oh, yeah, okay. So um, really quickly, your task is in the course of like 20 to 25 minutes, uh, find someone to lead the discussion, just someone to help things along. So hopefully somebody in your group is gonna volunteer to do that. Do a very quick round of round robin introductions. And the way to make that go quickly is for whoever introduces themselves, call on the next person to introduce themselves so that you just sort of, you don't end up with those awkward pauses between introductions. Uh, and then uh, it's really two points of discussion. Uh, for, for you all. Uh, what are some strategies you've been utilizing uh, for outreach uh, to connect with community members? And then really most of the time thinking about what challenges you're facing and what suggestions do you, and advice do you have for one another? Uh, we're gonna bring things back with just like a very quick uh, five minutes to go. So we'll come back into the full group and anybody who wants to um, can do a quick report out about what their conversation was. That's kind of an optional thing, but it would be great to hear some of you if you had some points of discussion. It's always interesting to hear what were some commonalities between the breakout groups. You know, I know some folks can't stick around for this. You know, we, we understand that some folks come for the presentation and are not necessarily able to stick around for the breakout sessions. Uh, that is okay, actually. Um, and, and for the rest of us, I think um, we're looking forward to, to some quick but some good conversations. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing screen. Uh, and, and by the way, we will be able to send some messages into the breakout groups that just kind of help guide this as well. So just to give you a sense of timing so you have a sense that the clock is ticking down. So at this point, uh, I'm gonna look to Nick, who's gonna send us all randomly into some breakout groups to have some of these conversations. So. All right, it should be all lined up. I'm gonna say, open all rooms you guys should get you know we've just got a, a a few more minutes here and i uh i want to prompt folks uh if any of you have something to sort of report back that you feel like might be of interest to the larger group i really uh i want to sort of open up this space for you all to do a little sharing uh from your conversation so uh there could be a show of hands if anyone is interested and willing to do that. Uh, I see Allison and then Jeff and then Liz and Wilda. Okay, so let's start with Allison. Yeah, um, something we just talked about at the end of our discussion in that breakout room was it had to do with meeting people where they're at. So making sure you know in whichever community you're trying to engage, what are the platforms that people actually use? Because I know here in Chittenden County, we really rely heavily on Front Porch Forum. But in other communities, it's listservs. In other communities, it's Facebook groups. Um, and then also realizing that not everybody is online. And so making sure that you're distributing your information and you're informing people in the places where people are actually still going, like libraries, grocery stores, that kind of thing. So uh, again, just meeting people where they're at. Great. Thanks, Allison. Uh... Jeff? Yeah, we had a great list of things. I'll, I'll just go very quickly through them. Um, Luna has used text messages, uh, like a flash type thing with the people's permission. Uh, letters home with school kids. Front page form obviously was a big one for all of us. Rose uh, is using different languages in their outreach materials, you know, different uh, countries. Uh, Sue, has, uh, Sue and Gary both use newsletters. Uh, Sue has a round table, one hour round table they use to get the word out. She also uses surveys with a feedback loop. So people that have tape filled out the surveys are, uh, you know, people know that they're being listened to. 
And uh, Gary has used uh, civic group membership to get the word out. And we've also used uh, setting up tables at things like a farmer's market and town meeting. So there's a whole bunch of great ideas. That's, that's a great list. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, yeah, Liz and then Wilda after that. Um, well, I don't want to be repetitive, so just echo what Allison and Jeff both said, because a lot of that came up for us as well. Um, and ditto framed by Andrea's, you know, start where people are at. But that combination of face-to-face, -face, social media, surveys, and using partners, either social service or farmer's market, depending on the demographic and really slicing and dicing the demographic to figure out how people best communicate and how to reach them. Um, and then we also talked about the kind of stark contrast between the rural communities that lack broadband connectivity and um, those of us in Burlington that you know really don't face that barrier and that came up as well. So it's a lot of the same themes. Great, thanks Liz. Uh, Wilda. Wilda, you're muted, hold on. Sorry about that, thanks for the rhyme. Okay, so in my group, I just shared something that I had uh, tried to reach um, uh, people in, in my uh, community. Uh, basically, my organization is a civil and, human and civil rights organization that's trying to fight uh, discrimination against people based on mental illness. And we were doing a legislative update based on our work in the Vermont legislature. And we were getting modest readership and click-throughs, uh, but as soon as we included a, a spotlight profile of an individual uh, in the community, uh, we found that our readership and engagement just kind of exploded. Um, and so um, it, we got more likes on Facebook, we've got shares, we've got um, um, People not only just reading this, the, the profile, but they're now engaging with the entire newsletter. Uh, and so I guess we've become a believer in the, in the power of personal stories to um, engage people with our work um, and meet other people like them. So uh, my group wanted me to share that. So I hope, <laughs> I've, I hope I've done our group justice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I see some thumbs up across the group. That's great. Uh, is there anyone else? I don't want to skip or any other. Oh, Nancy, great. Yes, yes. Our group came up with a lot of the same themes and uh, suggestions as we've already heard. One point we wanted to make was it's really important and okay to identify what doesn't work anymore. You know, what are we doing wrong and not holding on to it for sentimental reasons or ego reasons and be able to say, you know, that doesn't work, or it only works with a small group of the people we're really trying to reach. So bear that in mind. Don't rely heavily on the same old, same old. That's great. Hey, this is great. And it, and it, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I just real quick, because uh, the word list, listserv came up a lot, and I just wanted people to know, some of you may know, uh, Ver, uh, VP Digger did a story on listservs uh, on Sunday, uh, November 8th. So yeah, some of you have seen it. You may want to, you know, Google it because it's, it was very well done and, and it was relatively new type of thing for me. So if you want more information on listserv, check out VT Digger from uh, two days ago. And, and just on that point, one thing that I think we're going to do a future workshop on is uh, when you have a free vehicle like Front Porch Forum or some other listserv, part of your mission can actually be to grow participation in that because you know when you strengthen that resource, you're actually strengthening your communications channel. And so that's one thing I think we'll come back maybe with like a co-presentation with Front Forge Forum and maybe some other partners about thinking about how do we strengthen some of those communications channels because that both helps us in our community work, but also probably helps other community organizations too, because those strong channels are so helpful, especially when they're free, like uh, Front Porch Forum. So um, I see that it's 1130 on the dot. Uh, you know, I'm, I have to say, I'm, I'm pretty excited with this report back because it's affirming to, um, j to just know that like we sent you all out to these breakout groups 
uh, and and like you came back with really compelling things to report back on. That's a sign of success on our end. So really want to appreciate that. Uh, I want to appreciate our presenters today, uh, Jenna and Rebecca and Andrea. Uh, they were really excellent. And just stay tuned. There's more to come from this leadership network. We're really eager for your feedback and suggestions for future work. Sign up for the lunch break if, if you're game for more of this sort of networking and getting to meet other people around the state. We're pretty excited and a little nervous about how we do it in a way that's sort of fun and engaging, but really encourage you to sign up for that and stay, stay tuned for more. So thanks, thanks everyone uh, and have a great sunny Tuesday. Thanks everyone.